Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, Senior AP English and our objective now for the hour is to finish our conversation regarding the poetry of W.B. Yeats. Uh, yesterday we began our study of sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. Again, a dramatic monologue where you have an old man soon must die. He is metaphorically in a boat looking back over his shoulder <coughs> looking back to the country that he has lived in, namely the world. And about that world, he says, it isn't a country for old people. It is a country for young people in one another's arms, titulated that first box of the senses, caught in that sensual music like fish in a net, all neglect monuments of an aging intellect. We don't have the capacity to care anymore about the things that matter most in regards to works of art. Why? Uh, an aged man is but a paltry thing. Again, it's that leaf metaphor, <laughs> gone in a second. A tattered coat upon a stick, an old man is like a scarecrow. Again, as I said yesterday, if you've been blessed to see, as I recently was, a, a really ancient person about to die, and it is a blessing to see that, I mean, to be able to see that once in your life will give tremendous, profound influence to lang language like this. As the body begins to age, it begins to thin until it finally begins to literally look like a scarecrow. But in the process of aging, the soul begins to clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in the mortal dress. As the physical body begins to deteriorate, the soul begins to sing and clap its hands because it realizes emancipation is coming. In other words, there's two of you. There's a physical body and then there's a soul or spirit thing. And as the body physically ages, the soul begins to say, yay, I get to finally escape. And what kind of escape in this poem will that be? It will be a journey, a journey to the most beautiful city in the history of the world, the city of Byzantium, a city that stands and represents pristine art. Uh, again, as I said to you, they literally, at one point in the history of the city, they covered all the major roofs with a layer of fine gold so that in the morning as the sun rose and it hit that city, it would explode in light and of course, uh, all of the other artwork that's involved. Of course, the cathedrals still there, the Sophia and others, are considered still some of the greatest single architectural design works in the world. And in those beautiful cathedrals, you've maybe uh, seen pictures, or if you've you know, been able to travel Europe, you've seen these cathedrals. They have lots and lots of stained glass and mosaics, right? So now to part three. So we are in part three of sailing to Byzantium. Okay. And the speaker in our poem, in our dramatic monologue, will now speak directly to those works of art, those stained glass windows and the like. Oh, sages, I'm on page 1170, standing in God's holy fire as in a gold mosaic of a wall. Come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul. Now, let's pause here for a moment and define language. Of course, your sidebar will help you a little bit with this perning in a gyre. The easiest way to think about that is to kind of think about water going down the drain of your tub. You know how it spin, spin, spin? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good word picture, okay? What are sages? Well, we're back to monuments of an aging intellect. Only instead of talking about works of art, we're talking about human beings who are monuments of an aging intellect. Yeats says, or the speaker of our poem says, when it comes time for me to die, to sail away, I want to be taught how to do that right. Okay? Who are the people who have lived before me who kind of can help me to know what it's like to, two things, live well and die well. Notice we're back to where we began in our senior class together. We're back to Socrates, who will always stand and representative of the teacher who does two things. He teaches his students how to live, but he also teaches them how to die. How to die with honor, integrity, and dare we say it, courage, right? Now all of a sudden we find ourselves back thinking about not only 
that final, that, that, that final kind of three or four uh, important dialogues uh, you know, uh, of, of Plato, the Crito comes to mind immediately, obviously the Apology comes to mind, but the Phaedo, that poem, uh, call it a poem, that dialogue about what it's like to be at the very end of your life, moments away from drinking the hemlock and dying, Plato has got, he's telling jokes, he's in the lightest of moods. His disciples are sitting crying, and he can't understand why they're crying. And he says it in Phaedo. Have you not been listening to anything I've been saying at the fountain at the mall for all of these years? Did you expect me to live forever? Sooner or later, the physical body must decay. Look at the way that Elliot, or that uh, Yates says it. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Now, this is Yeats' eschatology, and I mentioned it yesterday. This notion that the human being is of two parts, a body and a soul. That soul, though ethereal, has a life, a life which preceded the, uh, you know, the incarnation to the body and will, in fact, proceed out of the human body. But notice the word picture. It's an interesting one. Walk the halls here in a few moments, only imagine it this way. It's almost like some kind of strange zombie movie, only watch it this way, in your mind's eye. See all of the people walking the halls, only they're walking really, really slow because they have a corpse chained to their ankle. They're dragging on the floor behind them. And so they have to walk really slow because this corpse is chained to them and they have to drag it around. By the way, of course, we know that the Romans did this as a form of punishment to often the enemies that they would defeat. Uh, because you fought in pairs, one was killed, the other was left alive. The corpse was chained to the body of the living person. And you literally had to carry that thing around until it decomposed, uh, until it literally fell so much apart that you no longer had it there. You were not allowed to intentionally desecrate that corpse any longer, any faster. It slowly, of course, we think about all five senses being attacked in a, in a situation like that. The smell, the stench, the sights, all of it would be, of course, collected. Here, though, Yates says it this way. All of us, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, all of us are carrying around a corpse. We're pulling a corpse behind us, and it's smelly, and it's gross, and it's decomposing, as your best or worst zombie imaginations can be. You just don't see it. You don't understand it. Your heart or your soul does... Because that's the way your heart or soul thinks about your physical body, like a corpse that it has to drag around. Ultimately, the goal, of course, is for the body to finally get to Byzantium, or to die, so that the soul can travel outside of the body. Where will it go? Well, for Yeats, all souls are kept in a single place somewhere in the infinite nowhere, right? where all those souls return back to and then wait for the process of reincarnation. Again, as I said yesterday in my lecture, Plato's Republic Book 10 tells a similar kind of myth, right? Where once you die, your soul goes into the underworld, you drink from the river Lethe, and then, of course, you have to reincarnate, only you get to choose what it is you want to come back as. Yeats is not unfamiliar with Plato's Republic 10, okay? We go now, finally, to the fourth part. Once out of nature, meaning what? What's that mean? Once out of nature, meaning what? Once I'm dead, right, once I'm actually dead. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. What's that mean? Put it in your own words, what's he say? Once I leave, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. What's he mean? I don't want to come back as what? I don't want to come back as anything with a body. Why does anyone want to come back as anything with a body? Why? He has to drag it around. Yeah, because I mean, if you come back with a physical body, it's inevitable. It's right there, right? 
In other words, there's another way to look at Victoria's Secret models. There's another way to look at Brad Pitt. There's another way to look at physically beautiful people. And it is a constant reminder that it won't be like that very long. Try that the next time you look in your mirror as you are primping for your festivities of the weekend, for example. And remind yourself as you see yourself, this isn't going to last very long. Only your instincts are, see, uh, to go, geez, what do you got to be a downer for? No, 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 you just missed it. Young people see that as a downer. Why? Because they're caught. They're caught in sensual music. They don't understand, right? Your soul looks at that and goes, yay, I don't have to be beautiful and young for very much longer. Yay. That's your soul. Your soul wants to escape the confines of the physical structure. Why? Because it cannot last. Well, once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. What do you want to come back as? Here it is. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make. Uh-oh. What's he want to come back as? What does he want to come back as? He doesn't want to come back as anything living. What's he want to come back as? Yeah, he wants to come back as a work of art. As Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor away, or set upon a golden bough to sing the lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Here we are met with an option. Upon death, if you must return your soul to re-inhabit, you've got two options. One, come back as something living, as in a human or an animal body of some kind or another. The second option is to come back as Keats's urn. Remember? That whispers, beauty is truth, truth beauty. Why would Yeats want to come back as a work of art? Set up on a golden bow to sing the lords and ladies of Byzantium, to keep a drowsy emperor away. Works of art have always been collected by people of wealth. Have you noticed this? They like to collect works of art, don't they, right? If you are at all familiar with the film Titanic, there's that fun little giveaway where he's talking about a new artist. They just got a whole bunch of brand new paintings by some idiot named, remember, did you follow it? Yeah, it was, it was Picasso, right? Okay, I got, this, I got these paintings and I, yeah, I don't know. Of course, they're going to become worth millions of dollars. People who are people of wealth collect works of art. And Yeats is obviously making a joke towards that. But why does he want to come back as a work of art and not as something human? I mean, we get it on the negative side. He doesn't want to come back to, you know, inhabit a body that deteriorates. But why would he want to come back as a work of art? Yeah, everyone will look at that. Well, supposedly everyone. Remember back to line one, caught in that central music, all neglect monuments of an aging intellect. He wants to come back as a monument of an aging intellect. How come? What do you think, Sin? Why does he want to come back as a work of art? He, yeah, that's the thing. You can outlive, if you come back as a work of art, you can outlive, right, the, the, the generations that are wasted by old time, to quote Keats from Ode on a Grecian Urn, right? If you can come back as a work of art, which is a really intriguing question. If you, just play the 3B game here for a second, if you had to come back as something, you had to reanimate, would you prefer to come back as something alive or something inanimate, a work of art. <coughs> jot, down in, jot down in 3B real quickly. If you had to come back, would you prefer to come back as something alive or something as a work of art? What would it be for you? Would you come back multiple times? Yeah, because you're going to, right? You're going to inevitably. Of course, that's an interesting question because if you come back as a work of art, you may last for a really, really long time before you finally are destroyed and then your soul goes back. Notice the suggestion as well that within a work of art, which is a really freaky way to think about this, within a work of art, there actually is a soul or a spirit. It's there. It's there. You just don't see it. Fascinating. What an interesting idea. Yates, of course, playing games with us all the way. All right, let's talk now for the final two offerings that we have quickly on page 1171, Second Coming. This is, again, I think lines we worked with, at least in the first stanza. We'll take a, we'll take a look at Second Coming, and then we'll take a look at When You're Old. Um, second Coming. Uh, to understand this poem, you have to understand one thing about Yeats as historian. Yeats studied history, and I do mean studied. He read pretty much everything he could in regards to, as I think I said to you, religious and mythic history. And about that study, he 
he discovered something quite fascinating, and it was the number 2,000. <coughs> now, this is a fascinating observation. <coughs> and Carl Jaspers, the great philosopher, has talked about the axial age and ages uh, of, of a certain number. But if you take a look at the history of the known world and you divide it up into 2,000-year-old um, cycles, interesting things happen at the very end of a 2,000 cycle and at the very beginning of a new 2,000-year cycle. Okay? Really important things, as in the most important shifts in human consciousness seem to happen for Yeats around these 2,000-year cycles, right? To that degree then, well, think about it. Yeats is living and writing during what time? His, his dates are there in the book if you want to take a look. What are his dates? He dies in what year, for example? What year does Yeats die? Right. So 1939 means 1,939 years since what? 1,900 years since what? Right. Which means we're only 70 years away from what? The new 2,000-year cycle about to begin. See how that works? Well, what's happened by 1939? Think about it. By 1939, World War I is come and gone. Agreed, right? And by 1939, we're already looking towards the conflict that will become and known to us as? Right? See how that works? So to that degree, monumental things are happening in Europe right at the end of Yeats' life. And he's very interested in the future. So about that future, he will write this poem and call it the second coming. What was the first coming? What was the first coming? If this is the second coming, right, the first coming was 2,000 years prior. Okay? It is a fascinating question to ask. If Christ was born on a given time in a given place, 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, what was happening on the planet? That is a very interesting question. And as I say, that is a question that Yates saw as no throwaway or no giveaway. Okay? That was an important moment in the history of, of the world right? for, for Yates. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at it, second coming. I think I already worked with this opening stanza, so I'll move rather quickly. The notion of anarchy is soon to come. Again, he writes this right before, right before the rise of Hitler and the Reich and all of that. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The sinner cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I don't want to break your heart, but we will finish our high school career in your senior year by looking at some really depressing texts. You're not going to find much joy and much optimism in the texts that we will be looking at. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men is the opening lines of the, of the next major poem we'll study. When you pick up Lord of Flies, disturbing. When you pick up Heart of Darkness, disturbing. I mean, it's right there in the title, Heart of Darkness. Hello. I mean, if you're looking for joy, if you're looking for some kind of solace, these are not the texts to come to. All of these texts are part of a melu that is the part of the time that Yeats is living. There is great concern that this very day would not come, would not happen. There was great concern. I mean, literally, uh, academics began to say things like, we're not going to make it. I mean, it's just impossible. When you start looking at the amount of death of the First World War, the technologies that we're going to invent, obviously we're going to figure out ways to blow ourselves up. And sure enough, this did happen, right? While the end of the Second World War, the theater for, for the Pacific and Japan does end with the dropping of those weapons. The new war begins that we, of course, qualify as the Cold War. But the real, real war that began was the war of anxiety in regards to crap. If we can make bombs that can actually explode, all of them explode at the same time, life on our planet is gone. How can we live with that kind of mutually assured destruction, blah, blah, blah? All of that kind of anxiety about the future is buried in much of the work, unfortunately, that we've got to finish with. Surely, 
Hope, hope maybe. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, exclamation mark. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Spiritus Mundi is that, is that um, consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal that knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Spiritus Mundi, that place where all souls reside until they reincarnate. Out of that, Yeats imagines, steps something. Who, what, take a look. Troubles my sight. Somewhere, colon, somewhere... In sands of the desert, and here immediately we think of Shelley's Ozymandias, don't we, right? That, that thing falling down in the sands of the desert. Only now we've got reanimation. In the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it reel shadows of the indigent desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Whoa, did you just see what you just read? His prediction is what going forward? There will be another, there will be another beast that will rise out of here, slouching towards Bethlehem. Another rocking cradle will produce another influential person, right? Of course, Yeats is often called a visionary or a prognosticator or a prophet because when he writes those words, a young wallpaper hanger is reading closely Machiavelli's Prince, only later to get involved in politics. And of course, you know of him as Adolf Hitler, right? Think about one man having such prodigious influence in the lives of so many millions of people. How can one person have that kind of power? And uh, uh, the word picture for Yeats here is he slouches towards Bethlehem. It's a disturbing prediction of things to come. Much has been made of the poem. I, I wish I had more time I'd exegete. But now we turn to the final offering of Yeats. When you are old. Yeats, like Keats, gets jacked in love. This is... <laughs> This is not totally unusual. Of course, if I were to ask you at 3A, just start making a list of the guys who seem to be motivated by the fact that they fell in love with a woman they couldn't get. And because of that, they seem to be motivated to produce works of art. Uh, once a student of mine said, it's probably true that Homer didn't get his girl, which is what motivated him to stay up all night writing that wretched poem I had to read. Which is an interesting way to think about what it means if a guy wants the girl really badly and then he doesn't get her. Keats, I told you, was very much in love. And she was very much in love. But because of the economic differences, couldn't, couldn't get together. So that at the end of when I have fears that I may cease to be, that final thing, that final win, and when I feel fair creature of an hour that I shall never look upon thee more, think about it. Bright star, he wants to be lying on his young love's ripening breast to feel forever the swell and fall, right, of the sweet unrest. That's the girl he never got to really be with. The night before he dies, he's writing a poem about her, right, okay? Yates is very similar. Only for Yates, the girl loves him back. And for Yates, he's deeply in love with her. It isn't economics that keep them apart. It's politics. Are you ready for this? She didn't want a guy in her life because she was so interested in politics. She was a revolutionary. She wanted to change the world politically. And the last thing she wanted was a husband and children because she was afeared that that would keep her from doing the kinds of work that she really felt she needed to do. Yates was devastated, devastated. I mean, he tried every which way he could to get this girl to marry him. No. When you are old. When you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true? But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced about the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. 
Why does a guy like Byron, when we two parted, why does a guy write a poem to the girl who jacked him and say in the poem, I hope someday you will remember and be made sad? Why does a guy do that? What is it? Is it his ego is so wounded that he has to make her feel sad? What well, do you think it is, Sin? Why? Like in this poem, he says, when you're old and you're no longer drop-dead gorgeous, take down this poem of poetry where this poem is published, and I hope it makes you really sad. R. That's what it is. This is a revenge poem, you think? But I don't understand. Yeah, but if he loves her, why would he want to get revenge? Or is it, or is it so like, this is what I felt, so I hope you feel that someday too. Yeah, so but it's going to make her feel it, sad. And then you'll realize what I have to go through. You know? And what she's supposed to, like, how she's supposed to respond to that in the future. She's got to be sad, right? And then she has to deal so with if it. he truly loves her, why would he ever want to make her sad? Why would a guy who loves a girl try, want to make her sad in the future because she jacked him? Is it just simply payback? I think it's like so that way it's like she's on the same level as him almost, you know? That, that means um, you made me sad because you wouldn't be with me. Fine, I can get you back by making you sad, only it's going to be... Or, hey, this is what you really lost. This is what you walked away from. Are you, are you ready for this? She did marry. She just didn't marry him later in life. She had a long life herself, but she didn't marry him. Uh, they, remained, they remained pals and stuff, uh, you know, but she never, she never would marry. Do you think there's a certain tension um, that, that women have to come to in regards to choosing between having a professional or an identity of their own and then marrying? Do you think that's still a challenge? Is it harder on the girl than it is on the guy, do you think? What do you think, Ms. Damiano? Is it harder on the girl? So, for example, girl goes to high school, graduates, goes to college. Is she going to college to get a degree and get a job? Or is she going to college to find a guy to get a husband to raise a family? Get a degree on that head. Get a well, degree? I guess it depends on the girl. Depends on the girls. Yeah, because some girls just go. So, so like some, guys go to school. some guys, some guys also go to college to, to look. What about not so much about a job, but your identity? In other words, I've often had female students to say, it's not about getting the degree and getting a job. It's about getting a degree and getting a job so that I can make a contribution to society that's of importance, whatever that is. In other words, I want my life to have meant something, and that means I cannot be trapped in a family with children and all of that. What are your thoughts? Maybe she just didn't like him and didn't want to break it to him. So she just nicely blamed it on something By else. all accounts, if you're talking <laughs> Yates, by all accounts, she dearly loved him. She did. It broke yeah, her but heart. He's going to say that she loved him, obviously. Yeah. No, no. She said it in letters and stuff. To other people, she even said it. She said I, I, that's the reason why she couldn't marry him. Because she knew if she married him, she would become the traditional wife-mother. Well, then maybe it was like more like she couldn't marry him because he, like, our, uh, like, they're both like, you know, high up, like, yeah. out there in identity. So maybe she felt like she needed to marry somebody. Yeah, like, got to marry somebody control. beneath. Yeah. <laughs> she went, marry to control. <laughs> but Batson just laughed. Do you think it's harder in college on girls or on guys? to think about this thing about your future. Girls. Why is it harder on girls? Because they're babies. Babies meaning what? They're sensitive to everything. Sensitive. Girls always have, it always seems like girls have like a plan and guys just go with the flow. So if the plan doesn't work out, the girls are always like more worried about it. Is a part of the plan for most girls now to get married and have kids? Why, Miss Sin, do you think it's not the case? Well, there's some. Is it because you guys have been taught for a long time you need to get degrees? I think, I think it depends on the family because there's a lot of true, girls in true. modern society that want to have... What about financial security? 
Do girls feel more now they have to have a degree because they're aware of the fact that if they don't get a degree and they do marry and they have children, if the guy leaves them, they're going to have to go out into the world and get a job. Or even if they do marry the guy, they're probably still going to have to work to contribute enough to the family income, right? So is it harder on the girl or the guy, do you think? The jobs like we're expected almost to go get a job and have a degree on top of finding a guy and having a family and taking care of. You think it's harder on the girls because there's more expectations on the girls. Now, was it a simpler time, back to our shoe factory story with Sherm and Anderson, was it a simpler time when Sherm just had to get up and go to, go to his shoe factory job and Anderson stayed at home with all the children and was not expected to get degrees and to do anything? Was it a simpler time? Or do you think that was like the curse of all curses, to be stuck in a situation where you've got no education? What do you think? I think that guys, in a way, they have it easier because of the whole shoe factory idea. Like, guys don't have as much, I guess, conviction or necessity to get a degree because there is a lot of other careers that they can go into where they won't need a degree, like oil fields. You're and saying those jobs that, are those jobs are not so open to women. They well, honestly, they aren't. My father worked on the rigs for several years, and he said if a woman comes and works for them, they just expect her to be a cook. They don't expect women to be able to do that manual labor, and I mean, working alongside men. And so, women nowadays, if they don't have a degree, finding a job is it's like what about, fast food restaurants. What about choosing? What about choosing a major if you're female? Do you find yourself saying, I've got to choose the major that allows me to get a job, but still allows me to be a, 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 a parent? So for example, I had this brilliant student who I taught, and she said, I know I could go to med school, but if I go to med school, that means I'm a doctor. And if I'm a doctor, that means I'm doing all of this work and I'm all these hours. I won't be able to be a mom and raise my children. And so to that degree, I'm going to go into education and get a degree in teaching and teach science even though I could easily get a degree and go to med school. What do you think, that's It's not necessarily true. It what? Not necessarily true. That perception that if you have a high-paying job, you have to commit yourself. Because my sister's a doctor, and she... Women can be... Children. Right. Women so. can be physicians. They can hold. What about a woman who would want to hold high political office? Do you think that's hard to do? to have high political aspirations while like, at the same time, yeah, you know, so take care of your children. The time kind of thing, because like, you know, more and more too are having to, like men are being like stay at home dads and stuff, I've seen that a lot. True. But still like if you have like a mom that is like, high, you know, and like, can't, I think it's more like they're constantly busy, you know, and they don't, you know, it's not like a mom who works at a, like a, a daycare or something and she can take care well, of her kids. I think it's more like a psychological, like, you know your mom is really there instead of like she'll come home and make dinner and pat you on the head and say go do your homework I love you and then go upstairs to your computer and work kind of thing. It's, well, it's, and it depends on the age of the children. Obviously, right, right, right. It's when all about very timing because if you if you're just starting out in your career in school when your child is just being born, then obviously there's going to be some issues there because while you're going to school and working, right. you're not going to be able to be at home with the baby. But right. if your children are you know nine, ten, and are able to have some independence, then that would be more of an easier time to have an independent job, an independent career, because your children aren't so much reliant on having you there all the time. Do you think the whole notion of going to college, meeting a significant other, getting married, having children, raising a family, do you think that whole notion is changing in your generation? Yeah. And if it is changing, in what ways is it changing? <laughs> is friendship the new marriage? So, for example, it's not so much about getting married, it's about finding someone with whom you can cohabitate, you can get along well with. It's not so much about getting married and having children and raising a family. I see a lot less of the just, oh, we fell in love so we're going to get married, but more, um, well, we'll we'd be a successful couple together. It seems like people are planning a lot more than just being spontaneous. You think that's because of economics? Stranger. Is that what it is? More economics? Probably. There was so much more pressure with like the way that the economy is and finding jobs and having a successful family. <coughs> Do you think people, educated people today, think longer and harder about getting married and having kids than maybe people of an earlier